Thank you for joining us today for our Forward Forum. This is our first in a three-part series um, of COVID-19 school health and safety measures. This forum is hosted by Ford Boone County and presented in partnership with District 100, District 200, and the Boone County Health Department. I'm Jen Jackie, and I will serve as your facilitator today. I would like to take this opportunity to give you a bit of background regarding Ford Boone County. This group first came to be in April 2020 to bring local leaders together to combat the impacts of COVID-19. These partners believe that we are stronger together. As you can see on this slide, Ford Boone County is comprised of organizations dedicated to Boone County. Next slide, please. It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters from the Boone County Health Department, Belvedere School District, and North Boone School District. Today from the Health Department, we will be hearing from Amanda Mail, the Public Health Administrator, Amy Peralta, the Contact Tracing Supervisor, and Ava Escada, the Case Investigator Liaison. From District 100, Dr. Dan Wiesman will be joining us. And from District 200, we have Dr. Mike Greenlee, Superintendent, and Julie Brasnan, Lead Nurse. This forum will be recorded and made available along with the slide deck. Today, our presenters will address many frequently asked questions that they have come across. We encourage questions at the end of the presentation. We ask that you please use the chat function at the end of the um, slides to ask any additional questions. Since this 90 is a 90 minute presentation, if the presenters do not get to all the questions during today's allotted time, or the presenters need time to research, we will follow up shortly with further answers. We ask that your questions please be informative, respectful, and constructive. We ask that everyone participating and listening in today work with us towards the common goal of protecting students and staff and preserving in-person learning as much as possible for the long term. I will now turn it over to Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. Jen, thank you so much for that um, very nice introduction. I'm Amanda Mail. I'm the Public Health Administrator here at the Boone County Health Department. Um, it's my pleasure to participate in these forums, the series of three uh, that we're going to be doing. Um, and I'm really pleased to be presenting with some of my frontline staff and then also with our school district partners. Uh, so today's agenda is going to be pretty jam-packed. I can tell you all right off the bat that um, this forum is going to be really slide heavy and really PowerPoint heavy because um, we've been compiling for weeks now the list of frequently asked questions that our respective departments are getting. And we want to take the time and the energy to go through those FAQs with all of you. Um, as Jen had mentioned, if there isn't time to get to everyone's questions that come up during the Q&A part of today's forum, uh, we will continue the discussions in the coming weeks. But please know that a lot of time and energy has gone in behind the scenes to um, take very serious seriously into consideration the FAQs that we get on a regular basis here at the health department and then at both of our schools. Um, so we're going to cover the goals for these forums, talk a little bit about the current collaboration that goes on uh, behind the scenes uh, between your local health department and your local school districts here in Boone County. We're going to provide links and resources to the guidance documents and the executive orders that um, our department and our schools follow. Uh, we're going to go through this very long list of frequently asked questions that have been compiled and um, submitted by all of you, as well as the things that we've heard over our phone lines and emails, as I mentioned in the last couple of weeks. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that um, the health department and our local schools face as we work through uh, what I would say honestly and candidly is just a bunch of really difficult decisions and trying to make the, the, least, uh, the least worst decision, as I like to say here in our office when we're working with our frontline staff to address uh, the challenges with keeping our kids in the classroom, minimizing quarantines and quarantine timeframes, and working to onboard and go live with testing strategies that allow uh, for the preservation and protection of in-person learning. Many, many challenges that we hope to further clarify and address. We're going to talk a little bit about some of our opportunities for improvement, both um, from the health department side and the school district side, and then talk a little bit about next steps, really how you all as parents and community members can help us to come together around these difficult issues. Next slide. Um, so our goals for the upcoming forums are going to be to provide weekly updates on the status of some of the things that we're going to discuss today. Uh, we'll continue to answer, answer your questions and concerns. We'll continue to reiterate and explain the challenges that we face 
Uh, we're happy to receive constructive input. Um, actually, one of the reasons that we put together this forum today and in the coming weeks is because of some very constructive uh, parent conversations and feedback that I have received. Um, and we want to work together with our parents. We want to work together with our community to solve some of these complex challenges. Um, so before I go any farther, I have asked um, two parents of children in our districts to just speak very briefly to a little bit about the concept of coming together and problem solving. Um, I know right off the bat that there's no way that all of our parents are going to agree with every decision that's made, are going to always agree with the um, guidance documents that our state and federal uh, health department agencies put out that our local health department then implements locally. Uh, but we do feel that we all have many common goals uh, in mind, which is the safety of our children and our staff, um, sort of the long COVID game, right? So COVID isn't going to be going away anytime soon. I wish there was an off ramp, but there isn't. And so if we're going to be doing this for the long haul, what is the game plan long term? How do we come up with sustainable solutions to these complex problems? Quick fixes um, are not going to help us in the long term. And the way that Boone County has been doing business is, is working together behind the scenes to build those long game strategies for what's going to keep kids in the classroom long term, not just what's the quick fix to getting one child back early from quarantine, right? So with that being said, I'd first like to turn it over to uh, Ryan Curry, who has joined us as a, a parent and a community leader to talk a little bit about kind of the tone that we want to set for today. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Amanda. I uh, appreciate the time and the consideration. Um, as uh, uh, the Board of Health knows and the, the school district is, I'm not a quiet parent. I'm a parent that uh, has um, has one speed normally and it's not slow. So I, I come hard at the paint many times when I ask these questions. Um, and Amanda and Dr. Weisman have both been on the receiving end of that many times. Um, I have a child who's been quarantined a majority of the school year and uh, I, I get the frustrations. Um, one thing that I would urge is uh, to have the conversation. Um, I, I could stand in front of the school board and, uh, and criticize Dr. Wiesman on his handling of things, and we might not agree on things, as I will with Amanda, and we don't agree on a lot of things. But at the same time, I know where both of their hearts are. Um, they're not here to, um, uh, to hurt our children in any way. So if that is a common thought, I would ask that you erase it from your mind immediately, because um, the way I, I, I say to Amanda is, is I think they're going too far above and beyond, which um, is a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. They care, they're showing that they care, um, but we disagree on the level of care. Uh, I think the common goal is we want masks off our kids in school and we want kids in class, um, not quarantined and, and their face uh, showed behind a mask. Um, but I would, I would really encourage parents to call the health department um, to understand what goals because uh, as talking with Amanda a lot of her goals are the same as mine it's just getting to those uh, those goals um, is where we might differ on things but I think I think there's a lot of common goals and I think it takes just a little bit of maturity and a little bit of a level of sitting down and speaking and kind of hashing things out and uh, having uh, <clears throat> having to give understanding and respect uh, from where each other are coming from and I would urge every parent to do that um, we don't have to agree on everything. Uh, clearly, I do not. Um, but we, we do have to respect each other and support each other. So uh, I would really recommend that and urge every parent to do so. I appreciate you giving me the time, Amanda. Great. Right. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, hopefully some of those questions and um, things that Ryan mentioned when we're hashing this stuff out with parents can can occur during these forums. That way, um, my guess is that when one parent has a question, there are other parents that have a similar question or a concern. So thank you for your input. Um, I'm going to turn it over to one more parent before we continue with the forum, and that would be uh, Melissa Gallagher, who has also joined us. Melissa? Hi, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to first off say thank you for allowing us to speak. And I'm not sure what other health departments are doing to help collaborate with parents, but you know, kudos to the Boone County Health Department for putting this forum together. Thank you for um, letting us bend your ear. And I wanted to also mention two facts, and I think that we can all agree all the parties involved here wants what, want what's best for our children. I don't think there's any dispute there. And the second thing that I'd like to say is I think we'd all agree that this virus isn't going away anytime soon. 
Um, the mandates, the vaccine, the mask, nothing seems to be stopping the threat of this virus. Um, I'm a concerned parent. I'm also a recovering COVID patient. My son and I both have had this virus here recently. Um, and so I think I can be part of the solution to this problem instead of trying to be part of the problem. Um, and I think if all of our goals are to do the same, I would urge you to, to do it with respect for the, every party involved, from the school administrators to the health department. All of us really want what's best for these kids. And we have to agree that we're not gonna agree on every part, but we have to do so with respect to each other's opinions and um, try to come to a peaceful solution on all the points and concerns that we have. I appreciate your time and thank you so much for putting this forum together. Thanks so much, Melissa. Next slide. Great. Um, so I want to uh, kick off the next part of the forum by talking a little bit about uh, the collaboration that goes on uh, behind the scenes between the health department and the school district. Um, so we have uh, scheduled meetings um, on a weekly basis. And then on top of that, um, I would say at least right now, we'll, while we're in the thick of uh, working through some of our biggest challenges with uh, preserving in-person learning and working through the logistics of bringing more testing to the schools and how we're going to roll that out, um, that we're talking on a daily basis. So there are formal briefings that the health department does with our school district uh, staff to provide them with training on the guidance that is ever changing and the updates that come along with that guidance. Um, there are Zoom calls, there are um, socially distanced and spaced out in-person meetings. There's a lot of informal check-ins. Uh, my frontline contact tracers spend most of their days these days on the phone with the school nurses and the school administrative assistants and all the folks that are um, sitting at the front desk of our um, district offices and our school buildings. They're working closely with uh, teachers and gym coaches and athletic directors. And there's a lot of informal conversations that happen as well. When we have a discrepancy in the guidance that we need to talk through, when we have a mandate that comes from the state um, that we find out about uh, really oftentimes at the very last minute or just right before it's going to go live to the public. So making sure that we're sifting through that, talking about that together and figuring it out. Uh, we're in constant communication uh, with each other. A lot of it is lessons learned and problem solving for uh, future action and decision making. And I feel pretty confident about the level of communication that happens. Um, I would uh, jokingly say that my full-time job is uh, working with the schools right now to address these COVID challenges, but it really is true. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wiesman just to comment a little bit on the, uh, the very large amount of time that we all spend uh, working together on these things. Yeah, so I would say in addition to oftentimes Amanda being the first person I speak with in the morning and the last person I talk with before dinner, um, we do these scheduled meetings happen on a regular basis and are really helpful to keep not only the leaders in the district informed, but also our school nurses uh, who are really on the front lines of this. And so the opportunity for our school nurses to interact with and ask questions directly of the health department is, I think, something unique in our county and very helpful. An example for uh, of maybe some unscheduled uh, meetings. I would give an example. We had recently a, a sports team uh, where a few positive cases popped up. And so we had to uh, isolate a handful of those students. And there were some pretty restrictive guidelines that the state uh, Department of Public Health had put out. And so we were able to meet with our local health department here. Um, they were able to help us understand those restrictive guidelines but then also advocated for maybe a different approach with the state and the state did end up uh, modifying some of their uh, perspective on that because we had worked so closely with the health department and uh, everybody was able to see each other's perspective. So um, that was kind of a combination of meetings that happened over a course of a few days uh, that weren't scheduled but became a priority uh, for the health department in order to help uh, get our kids safely uh, back to school as quickly as possible. So we, we appreciate those. Um, and I'll throw it, I don't know, Dr. Greenlee, if you got anything to add. Sure, thank you, Dan, thank you, Amanda. Um, I would say the same thing. We've, we've been very fortunate to partnership with uh, the Boone County Health Department. This started, gosh, I wanna say three, uh, March 13th, 2020, where I think Amanda and I were on the phone hour after hour after hour as we're trying to figure out what's going on with schools as COVID uh, began to hit, uh, hit our area. 
and really kind of turn our uh, community upside down here for the last year and a half. Um, they have been a wonderful partner to be with. Um, we uh, spend every week on Fridays uh, making sure that uh, we're all on the same page. And I think that that is one thing that has been very hard to do, but we're working very hard to do, is to be consistent across the entire county, both with responses, answers, whether it's to quarantines um, uh, or any of the other protocols and the guidelines that are coming from the state. Often the governor will give you an executive order and really we're waiting then for guidance on what that means and having to work uh, with a strong partnership through the Boone County Health Department as to what that means for our schools and uh, our kids and our community and our parents as, as we work through those things. Um, those Friday meetings are important. I know that then after those Friday meetings, a lot of times I'm working with our nurse team to make sure that uh, our our district is also consistent with what is being asked from the health department and what we've learned often and over and over. And over. But I think all of us do have um, one collective goal and that's to keep our kids safe and healthy. So thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Greenlee. Um, I would say too that uh, another uh, series of impromptu meetings that we have had have been uh, troubleshooting situations where we've had large numbers of kids that have had to be um, sent home for quarantines because of exposures. So one of the things that we do is oftentimes when there's a large group of students that um, have been sent home to quarantine is we get together with um, the school, the principal, the administration at that particular building, and we talk through kind of what were the sequence of events that led up to that exposure? Is there anything that can be done differently in the future? Are there ways in which um, spacing kids out or double checking mask wearing or other logistical elements within those busy school days can be adjusted or modified to minimize the number of kids that have to be sent home the next time that there's an exposure. Um, so we call that rapid action uh, quality assurance, right? So we want to work on ways that we can limit those numbers of kids that we have to send home. Next slide. Great. Um, so we wanted to provide parents with um, the most comprehensive list of the guidance uh, mandate and executive order documents that uh, our department as well as the school districts are, are uh, required to follow. So we have cha um, challenges with this because we do have guidance documents that are issued from the federal level as well as from the state level. Um, these guidance documents are regularly updated as COVID-19 changes as we learn more about the virus as transmission rates fluctuate in our community or in our region or in our state. Um, and sometimes what we find to be the biggest challenge with these documents, as uh, Dr. Greenlee had mentioned, is an executive order will come out um, and then we'll be waiting on the guidance document that pairs with the executive order. Um, another challenge will be that sometimes at the state level, a guidance document has been updated, uh, but we're waiting on confirmation from the federal level um, parent document to correspond with before we move to implementation at the local level. Um, when these documents don't line up or when one is um, behind as far as receiving the update, that can make it increasingly challenging to implement something new uh, when we're still waiting on confirmation that the state level and federal level pieces will fit together. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen over the last 20 months or so is um, the sports guidance does not always line up with the um, in-person back to school learning guidance um, does not always line up with what the CDC has put out as far as their uh, transmission risk levels and as far as what they're recommending for athletes because they're governing not only the state of Illinois, but they're also governing other states where transmission levels may be different or where some logistical challenges or implementation challenges may be different as well. So I would say from the health department's perspective, that's been the hardest piece is keeping up with the changes, finding the discrepancies and bringing that information forward to our state and federal partners, and then trying to patiently but not so patiently wait for those guidance documents to realign when those updates happen so that then we can move to implementation at the local level. Dr. Wiesman, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think um, probably the most significant change here that parents are starting to feel um, is the executive orders around remote learning. Uh, so at the beginning of the school year, uh, there were some pretty specific um, a direction from the state not to uh, provide 
a whole litany of remote learning options. I think most of this was to really encourage families and make sure that families weren't staying home unnecessarily. Uh, the state superintendent did want all students to return uh, to in-person learning. But then at the end of September, uh, the governor issued an order really requiring school districts to provide remote learning to students who are quarantined or otherwise for COVID related health issues have to be home. And so um, I know in District 100, uh, we pivoted, uh, made some changes here this week for our middle school and high school students. And next week we'll be rolling out some changes for our elementary school students. Uh, same on our side. Yeah, we always notice that the guidance or the, the executive order comes out from um, uh, the governor goes through ISBE and then it comes back down for us to figure out how the guidance works. Uh, the last guidance, like um, Dr. Weisman alluded to, was the remote uh, learning for those kids that are home on quarantine. We have implemented it. I want to say uh, we're in week, week two of it now, and we have um, uh, we have it set up where our kids five through 12 can listen to lectures uh, on online for all of their classes when they're on quarantine. And then our students that are uh, at K-4, we have periods of time where they're set up to be able to get ELA help, math help, or any other type of help that they uh, help they need within the morning. So um, it never seems to fail. The moment you get one thing set, guidance seems to change and we're, we're adapting on the fly. So I would say, if anything, I appreciate our parents' patience as each time this stuff changes, we try to look to pivot and make sure that we're meeting the needs of uh, what's requested by the governor. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Greenlee. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, so I have a series of slides that um, I'm just going to flip through quickly, and then I just want to talk broad strokes about some of the things that the local health department monitors and watches as we um, make decisions based on uh, transmission rates and not only community level metrics, but also um, what we call our school metrics. So there are several um, dashboards that are embedded within the Illinois Department of Public Health website, and I'm going to chuckle a little bit and tell everybody uh, candidly here on the forum that I went about an hour ago to check the updated statistics that are available usually around noon on a daily basis on the IDPH website, um, and they have reconstructed their entire data dashboard. So when you click on the links that are provided here, they are live working links, um, but the graphics that we so carefully cut and pasted for today's presentation, uh, the website looks completely different. So they have overhauled the website. Um, data and metrics are the same, but where you find the information and what it looks like like is going to look different than these slides. So that's a true example of how quickly COVID-19 data and information changes. Uh, the data are the same, but the way in which it's um, being forward faced presented has has changed a little bit. So that tripped me up this afternoon when I when I took a look at what was happening. So we are looking at uh, what the CDC puts out what we call uh, the transmission levels uh, for county by county uh, based community metrics. We are looking at regional data. Um, and the Boone County is in region one, which is the Rockford region, there's nine counties in our region, uh, we are looking at the Illinois Department of Public Health county level metrics. And then we are looking at layered on top of that, the school-based metrics. So those are gonna be um, incidence rates of COVID and transmission rates of COVID, positivity rates of COVID and uh, case rates per 100,000 amongst our youth population. Um, so we can't look at schools in a silo because children are part of a larger community uh, where community transmission rates affect what children and even staff would be potentially bringing into the building and exposing other individuals too. So here's the link to the, um, the regional metrics available on the Illinois Department of Public Health website. This is forward facing available to all of you. It's updated around noon every day. Um, what we're mostly looking at for regional metrics are um, hospital capacity and availability. We want to make sure that there's enough hospital beds, ICU ventilators, um, and med surge beds uh, for any patients that would be coming from Boone County to be serviced at a Rockford area hospital. Um, there are thresholds that we monitor for that as well. Uh, we do also look at um, case Cases amongst youth that are um, admitted to the emergency room with COVID-like illness or admitted to the hospital and monitored in the hospital setting. Uh, next slide. 
Okay. Um, this is the county level metrics that the um, state puts out. As I mentioned, there are eight target metrics that they're looking at. I know people have probably heard um, the positivity rate discussion because that was um, heavily watched last year when um, regions and counties were under mitigation measures for uh, businesses and retail, bars and restaurants, et cetera. Um, that is one of eight metrics that are reviewed. Um, case rates per 100,000 is uh, a pretty typical metric that public health uh, authorities would be using not only for COVID, but for any infectious disease that's circulating in a community. Uh, we do watch death rates. We do watch the number of tests that are performed because we want to make sure that there's enough testing capacity. We're going to cover this a little bit later in the forum, but we are very patiently, not so patiently waiting for more test availability to be um, not only here in the community, but also within our schools to assist us with um, some of these modified quarantine options that we're working towards. Uh, we're also watching hospital admissions at the county level. So we're currently in orange warning status. Uh, the target would be to be in blue or minimal transmission. Um, I will warn you all that are listening that there is an absolute overkill of color codes, right? So the state's using one color code, there are county level color codes, there's regional benchmarks, and then the CDC has another color coding system. I know that it's been a big logistical challenge for the state of Illinois to try to work with the CDC to align their color codes. Uh, but in the meantime, we work very hard locally to explain the difference between the color codes and clarify the numbers that correspond to those colors and then how that gets interpreted in the guidance. Next slide. So the CDC's uh, color coding system is low, moderate, substantial, and high. Uh, Boone County has been in uh, high or substantial uh, status really for the last 10 to 12 weeks at this point. Uh, one positive piece of news is that we are slowly starting to see not only positivity rate decrease, um, but we are also starting to see case rate per 100,000 decrease. So I would say that about a month ago, uh, we were up over 200 uh, cases per 100,000. Uh, we have dropped down to when I looked today, I believe we were at 112. Uh, we do have a threshold of under, under 100 that we would like to get to to move us back down into substantial. And then from there, we're hoping to see a very quick decline into moderate. So this helps to drive some of the decisions that are made about how much uh, virus is circulating in our community and what are safe modified quarantine options that are allowable based on uh, transmission rates locally. So like I said before, and I want to reiterate the point that uh, uh, schools do not operate in a silo, so those children go home to families, extended families, they have after school activities, um, they go on play dates on the weekend, they're involved in community activities and volunteering uh, book groups, play dates, etc. And so we do look at um, youth rates, but we also have to look at the bigger picture of what's happening countywide and regionwide too, um, because that is going to affect uh, the potential risks of exposures in, in our school buildings. Next slide. Okay. Um, and these are school metrics. I will warn you that this uh, dashboard looks very different now. Um, it, I spent some time on it this afternoon, like I said. Um, I think it's a little bit more user-friendly and I like the fact now that it actually shows a trend, trend line. So it shows seven day rolling averages, which is helpful because just one rate per day um, can be a hard um, number to to understand. It's easier if you can look at a trend line and you can say, okay, I can definitely see that the case rate per 100,000 has been decreasing over the last three weeks and there haven't been any spikes, which to me would signify as a clinician myself, a substantial and a stable decrease. That's exactly what we want to see because that moves us into um, opening up more options for um, shorter, more modified quarantines. And once we have testing up and running, some testing options that will keep more of our kids in the classroom uh, for more days out of the school year. I'm really happy to report that the youth case increase has been minimal and we've seen that stabilize over the last three weeks. We've been watching that pretty intently. So we wanna be in the blue category. So this again is a state color coded system that I'm referring to. It's blue, uh, or blue yellow, orange, and red uh, for the school metrics. And um, these have stabilized quite a bit in the last three weeks, especially. When we do our weekly calls with the school we go over these numbers and we talk about these trends so that as we're preparing to implement um, new strategies, we can plan based on uh, what we're seeing in the data and what we're seeing in the metrics. Next slide. 
Okay. Um, and then the masking guidelines as well. I know that was uh, mentioned at the beginning of the forum. Uh, we know that there's an executive order out uh, that K through 12 schools um, are mandated to be wearing masks. Um, and so we've been uh, working with the mask mandate as one of several techniques um, that help in schools to mitigate the exposure risks and the spread. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of this mandate, knew where to find it. And I wanted to mention that masking is um, an incredibly useful tool, tool to stop the spread, especially in a classroom setting, but it's not the only tool that we're using. So we're looking at masking, we're looking at testing options, we're looking at spacing or social distancing, and then we're looking at uh, proper hand hygiene um, and hand washing. And those combined, um, um, allow us to keep more kids in school for longer periods of time, which is the goal of everybody on today's forum. Next slide. Um, so we're going to dive into some of the frequently asked questions that we get. We do get a lot of questions about the numbers. So I want to make sure people knew where to find those numbers um, and what specifically we're watching and why. Um, so let's hit some additional FAQs. Next slide. Um, so people ask a lot where they can go to be vaccinated if they um, still are not vaccinated and have made the choice to be vaccinated or, or are considering vaccination and want to know where they can go. Vaccinefinder.gov um, is a great place to punch in your zip code and find locations within 10, 25, 50 miles, as well as some of our local uh, clinics and uh, pharmacies that do offer uh, vaccination at this time. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine is the vaccine that's available for uh, currently approved for 12 and up. So that would be the one that if you have school-aged children that are age eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine would be the brand that you would be looking for when you're inquiring at one of these facilities as to whether they do carry the Pfizer vaccine. Next slide. Here's a screenshot of what Vaccine Finder looks like. It helps you to find locations in your area. Next slide. Um, and then we do have some mobile clinics that are deployed around the county, as well as a walk-in clinic um, that is available every Thursday here at the Boone County Health Department. Some of our future plans are some indoor school-based clinics for the general population. As we move into the winter months, the mobile units that the State Health Department has deployed to our community to help with vaccination efforts uh, will no longer be parked in parking lots when the weather gets too cold and when we have freezing rain and snow. So we will move those locations uh, safely indoors. And then we're um, planning uh, beginning the planning efforts for elementary and middle school youth clinics because we do believe that the uh, Pfizer vaccine will receive some emergency use authorizations through the FDA and the CDC to begin vaccinating youth that are under the age of 12 in the age bracket of 5 to 11. Next slide. Okay. Um, testing sites that are available. So we want to make sure that um, you all know where to uh, find uh, testing sites here in our area. Um, I would say that there is a shortage, in my opinion, of testing available. Um, we are working hard to not only stand up additional testing at both of our school districts, but we're also going to have some additional community testing that will come back to Boone County. We did have mobile units uh, back last year, and then the state did remove those units when transmission rates were lower. Um, we feel that it's necessary again, and we've been working now for several months in a row um, to try to get those deployed here locally. There are testing uh, locations in the greater Rockford area that are accessible uh, to Boone County uh, residents, and there's some links here, although I, I will warn you that vaccines.gov, uh, the site was down uh, when I checked it most recently. Um, I'm sure that they're performing some updates, but that would be the link that you would go to when it is back up and running. Next slide. Um, I would like to caution um, the listeners of our forum. Uh, we do have a, a private uh, testing site that we performed an inspection on here last week. Um, they are not properly reporting their information to the Illinois Department of Public Health. Therefore, those testing results are not uploaded in a system where our schools or our health department can uh, see and verify that testing information. We also had some concerns about the physical trailer that is being used to perform testing. So we're asking you all please to um, not use that as as a verifiable testing site at this time. Next slide. Great. Um, so I am now going to turn the forum over to um, some of our frontline staff that both work at the health department and our public schools to talk a little bit about uh, the testing that we do have in place and the testing that we're working so hard to get implemented, differences between them, and uh, share a little bit of information. So um, Julie Brosnan from District 200 and Amy Peralta, contact tracing supervisor from the Boone County Health Department. Thank you, Amanda. 
Um, in the school setting, uh, we have two types of testing that we're going to be using to um, help mitigate the spread and identify cases within the schools. Um, by next now is um, a test that we implemented last spring um, and have been using it ever since. Um, and it's a rapid test, um, fairly non-invasive. It's a nasal swab. Um, it uses a swab, I'm not sure if you can see this, um, just the very tip of it goes inside the student's nose or the staff member's nose and you swab it and um, you can get a result in 15 minutes. Um, most kids find it not um, scary or um, it doesn't hurt at all. So um, like I said, both tests can be used. Um, the other test is COVID Shield, um, which we will be implementing soon. And Amy will go into that a little bit further in just a second. Um, when we use both together, it allows us to um, take advantage of some of the early release options, such as test to stay or the seven day early release. Um, so if you know parents are interested and their students being eligible for those um, types of early release options, it's really important to make sure that you have a consent for both of these tests on file um, with the school. I know um, in, at least in District 200, we have sent home these consents a couple of times and I'm pretty sure in District 100, maybe Dr. Wiesman could speak to that a little bit better about the consents being set, sent home. Um, but if you need in District 200 um, consents, just reach out to your um, school nurse to get those. Um, and Amy, if you want to cover COVID Shield. Happy to. Dr. Wiesman, did you have something to add? Yeah, um, I just, uh, Julie mentioned, we do have parents sign that consent form uh, for Binax now. And uh, we regularly um, have students that are able to come back early from quarantine because the families are willing to do that early testing. And we're excited about that. And it's great to get that back early. Awesome, thank you. So I'd like to share with you about COVID Shield that is coming to both of the schools um, in short order. So Shield is a non-invasive PCR saliva-based test. Um, it is a um, this test is a proactive approach to identify pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals to allow those individuals to quarantine and reduce virus spread. Um, results of those tests are sent directly to the school district. Um, and IDPH, Illinois Department of Public Health, um, through a HIPAA compliant health records portal um, within 24 hours of the samples entering the lab. Um, the goal of, of COVID Shield is to prevent transmission of COVID-19, curb outbreaks in school and the community, and also keep students in classrooms. Um, a couple of the key variables, um, vaccination rates vary across the state. So children under 12 are not eligible yet to be vaccinated. So one of the advantages of the COVID shield is that um, it continues to shield and protect those who are unvaccinated in school and at home. Another variable is the potential for increased flu and respiratory illness. Um, the advantage to, to the shield test is that it allows school to rule out COVID and keep students in the classroom. Another variable is that spread continues to be greater during extracurriculars. Um, the advantage to the COVID shield is that early identification minimizes the number of individuals required to quarantine. And the final uh, variable is the risk of new variants remains. And with the shield test, um, it identifies potentially more contagious individuals sooner. Um, Shield's PCR test is highly accurate and can screen for variants. Um, so the COVID Shield test does test on three genes instead of one. Um, a lot of the other PCR tests do only test on one. So um, this does allow them to um, pick up pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic um, and also label them as positive. Um, it makes them extremely accurate in detecting positive and negative results. Um, as viruses mutate, Shield's test has superior detection abilities compared to a one gene approach and can, can, can screen for variants of concern. Um, a, I just wanna point out too, a positive result of a COVID Shield test will override any negative Binax Now test results. Um, and finally, just to um, reiterate um, how Shield and, and Binax Now together are a very powerful combination. Um, Shield is a molecular test. Um, it does provide earlier virus detection than antigens. Um, also more reliable rate of true positive results in antigen tests, and it is the gold standard diagnostic test. Binax now um, provides faster results in molecular tests. Um, it's most accurate when symptoms are present, and its accuracy is comparable to a PCR test when symptomatic and or high viral load exists. Next slide, please. 
Now I'd like to introduce a short video that shows how K through 12 schools are collecting saliva samples for SHIELD's COVID-19 test. Just so everybody knows, I believe there just is no audio on this. The point of this video is just to kind of watch. Let's take a look at some of the ways that Shield Illinois School Partners are collecting saliva samples to test for COVID-19 without losing much instructional time. First, let's see how one school partner uses a common area, like a gym, for students to provide saliva samples. The teacher hands the student an ID badge with a personal QR code identifier. Once the student reaches the collection area, she sanitizes her hands and receives her test tube and funnel. She proceeds to a designated area, removes her mask, and begins depositing saliva in the tube using the funnel. She taps the side of the tube lightly to settle any bubbles and raises her hand once her saliva reaches the fill line. Once a staff member recognizes her, the student walks to the staff member to verify her saliva sample. Then she discards her funnel in a medical waste bin, screws on the test tube cap, and proceeds to the checkout station. At the checkout station, her QR code is scanned followed by the label on her test tube in order to associate the test tube with her. She places her test tube in a collection rack, then sanitizes her hands once again and leaves the collection area to return to her classroom. The student is the only person at the collection site who ever touches the test tube to prevent contamination. Including time spent traveling from her classroom to the collection area and back, this student needed less than five minutes to provide a sample. Now let's look. Great, thanks, uh, Jen and Heather from Forward Boone for uh, playing that video for us. <clears throat> so we wanted to also provide the link to um, the executive order regarding quarantines and exposures. And we just pulled a little bit of the guidance uh, language out of that order here uh, for the slide. And then there's a, a link included here for um, executive order number 91 related to quarantine and exposures. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's some additional information. Um, there are different quarantine options, which we're gonna talk a little bit about here later in the forum. Um, and then there's different stipulations related on transmission risk and testing availability um, that are placed on those quarantine options. Um, so again, here's some additional information for those of you who are listening in so that you know uh, where the orders and the guidance are coming from and what the language states. Next slide. 
Um, and then just one more uh, slide here covering executive order number 91. Um, we do have to follow not only quarantine and exposure um, mandates and guidance, but we also have to follow um, isolation protocols. So isolation um, and quarantine are different. Uh, the lengths of time are different and the stipulations depending on specifically where the exposure occurred, who was exposed, um, symptoms, et cetera, are taken into consideration. We're gonna spend um, a large majority of the rest of the forum covering some of that and going through some different scenarios, which will hopefully help to clarify some things for um, our parent viewers. Next slide. Okay, great. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to uh, Amy and Julie and some of our frontline uh, staff at the district and the health department to uh, cover more in depth uh, some details related to uh, the exposure process and exclusion, um, as well as uh, quarantines and uh, some different scenarios. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so I'm going to go over some uh, factors to consider in regards to different types of ex exposures, um, as it, it, there's uh, different um, things to consider to actually determine the time of uh, the the um, eligibility and how, what how to determine who is considered a close contact when. Uh, for example, uh, household contact, um, they have a higher risk of actually um, having COVID themselves. Whereas if the exposure happened in a classroom setting, we look at uh, anybody that was within uh, three, zero to three um, feet of distance from that uh, positive case. If the exposure happened to have uh, happened outside of a classroom setting, um, then we're looking at um, six uh, feet distance. Um, also, we consider was the exposure in a bus setting. Um, that also brings in uh, further questions: Was were the windows uh, open? Was is there a filter, a HIPAA filter, in the bus? Uh, did the exposure happen in the lunchroom, uh, lock room? Um, that uh, were they wearing masks. So all these are factors that we have to take into consideration when the exposures happen to, to determine um, who will be uh, considered uh, a close contact. Um, also, uh, when it comes to sports, we have to consider is this uh, an indoor sports? Is, is it uh, uh, outdoor sports where um, as a general rule, if they are not, um, in like a crowded space, it would be, we wouldn't consider them a close contact, but there are other factors that we have to take into consideration, such as were they, did they share a locker room? Was there, were they sitting for a long period of time among other people that were not vaccinated? So again, this is uh, more, there's a lot of factors to consider whenever an exposure is being um, looked into and investigated. Um, so yeah, is, is anybody who the exposure, um, are they vaccinated? Um, if they're vaccinated, are, are they having symptoms? If they're not vaccinated, were they fully masked? So again, there's a lot of factors that come into play that uh, both the districts and the health department work on so that we can determine who um, should be quarant um, quarantined or excluded um, whenever uh, we find out that there is an exposure in the, in the, in the school. Next slide. Now, um, we have different quarantine options. Currently, uh, we only have option number one and two available, but I am going to go ahead and cover um, all the options. Um, the first one is the standard one that uh, we have been working with for a while now, which is 14 days. Um, and this option is primarily for non-school exposures, uh, such as household members or any uh, close contacts that are within the household. Um, there will be times that we might need to implement this uh, if there is uh, an exposure where there was an extended uh, period of time that 
the the exposure was you know they were not wearing a mask or if they were again sharing a locker room a crowded space and it was uh, a longer period of time um if they were sharing a hotel room if they were on a on a sports strip um that kind of uh, information is something that we take into consideration um the longer the exposure time the higher of a risk of uh that person um get, getting covid they are close contact getting COVID themselves. The second option is the 10 day quarantine, uh, which it is allowing people to reduce the, the quarantine to 10 days. Um, and this is only available for uh, school exposures, um, both for students and staff. And uh, there are some um, things that would need to be met in order for the staff members and students to be eligible for this. Um, they would have to do be in full compliance with the contact tracing team, uh, meaning that we do an interview and we um, do the daily health assessment that has to be done. Also, um, no symptoms of COVID-19 developed during the daily health assessment. Um, the testing is completed on or after day, day 10 with a negative test result. Now, uh, students and staff can return on or after that day, um, day 10, um, as long as they get tested. Some of the schools have the Binex now uh, um, available for them that they can get tested that morning. And uh, if they test negative, the, the child or staff member, can, staff member can return to school that same day. Um, Another thing is individuals will have to maintain physical distancing and be able to consistently and properly be wearing a mask uh, upon returning to, um, um, to school. Next slide. The third option is the seven day uh, quarantine. This at this time is not available. Uh, we will have this option available once the shield testing is in place uh, in both districts. Um, this is also for school exposure and uh, it, it, it also can apply or can be applied for students and staff members. Um, this is uh, for um, the student staff member to end their quarantine after day seven. But again, the same with uh, option number two, they will have to be in full compliance with the contact tracing uh, team. Um, again, doing the interview and the daily health assessments. There are no symptoms present during the daily health assessments and they test, um, the, the, a negative test is completed uh, on uh, day six or after day six uh, with a negative uh, test result. Also, uh, they would have to uh, maintain physical distancing and properly and consistently wear a mask upon returning to school. Next slide. This is the fourth and last option, which is a test to stay. Um, this one is not available right now, um, but once the SHIELD testing is implemented in schools and also the community transmission level is at a low or moderate um, level, then this would be uh, a, an option that would um, be available for the schools. Um, this one requires four individuals to test on day one, three, five, and seven after the exposure. Uh, keep it in mind that days, uh, the day of the exposure is going to be always day zero. Um, to be eligible for the test to stay, the both the uh, confirmed or probable case and the close contact must have been uh, must aware or have been wearing um, consistently a mask during the time of exposure. Um, this is also only available for um, ex in, uh, school exposures, not for household exposures. In all the options that we mentioned, the early release options, uh, the daily health assessments or daily health uh, symptom monitoring would have to be completed throughout the remaining of the 14 days. Keep in mind that uh, those 14 days, there's still a possibility that uh, somebody that was exposed, uh, close contact, could still develop some symptoms. So it's important to continue to um, monitor those symptoms to ensure that they no symptoms appear. And uh, if this were to happen, um, that person isolates right away and, and um, follows up with a test. Next slide.
So we included this slide. We thought it would be helpful for families to see um, the list of symptoms that um, we use uh, per the guidance. Um, to determine which students we need to exclude um, each day. And um, that list does include fever of 100.4 degrees or higher, a new onset of moderate to severe headache, shortness of breath, new cough, sore throat, vomiting, diarrhea, new loss of sense of um, taste or smell, uh, fatigue from unknown cause, and muscle or body aches from unknown cause. Um, it also is helpful for parents to know, you know, these symptoms, if you identify these in your student to keep them home, um, you know, that day from school and not send them. Uh, next slide. This, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so this is the, the one of the tools that the school and the health department uses to um, kind of determine who should be excluded and how to ensure if there are any close contacts, um, if the close contacts need, need to be excluded as well. Um, on the top here, it says it has the, uh, the symptoms that Julie just reviewed, but it also uh, um, on columns and rules, it gives you like scenarios and then what to do in the event. Um, it has a real brief, like, brief, but very helpful information as to uh, what to do in the event of. So there is a, a scenario A, B, C and D, and then across it would tell, um, it, it guides us on what steps to follow. So this is a, a very, very useful um, tool that uh, we have used for a while. It has been updated a few times. Um, and uh, I'll pass it on over to you, uh, Julie, so that maybe you can share with us why, how the, the school implements using this uh, decision tree. Thanks, Eva. We do use this, the school nurses use this religiously um, each day to determine, you know, when we need to exclude a student. Um, one thing I just wanted to add was that, you know, we do take into consideration students who have like an established history of pre-existing health you know, conditions such as allergies. Um, so, you know, if a student comes in and they're very congested, we do, you know, it is kind of a case by case um, situation. We try to work with families and determine, you know, is this something normal for that student? or um, is this a new symptom that we really should be, you know, sending them home and um, considering it to be an illness. So um, we do use the, the decision tree though. It's very helpful in helping us to determine and try to, you know, minimize the number of students that we're sending home. Next slide. I'm gonna go over three different situations that may um, be presented to the schools um, for students, faculty, or support staff. Um, so if you do have um, student school staff member that tests positive for COVID-19, the school must send home the student or staff member or have them transported by a parent or guardian as applicable for further medical evaluation by a healthcare provider. The next step is for the school to implement cleaning and disinfection of the areas where the case may have been present as per CDC guidance. The next step is for schools to notify families, teacher and staff that have been um, that a confirmed case um, was identified in the school or daycare setting as soon as possible while maintaining confidentiality. The next step is for the school to identify and exclude individuals identified as close contacts by the school or the local health department. And then finally, that case will be excluded for 10 days. Um, they may return on calendar day 11 after symptom onset or positive test collection date um, if asymptomatic and fever free for 24 hours and symptoms improved. Next slide, please. The next um, situation, again, for school and student staff members alike, um, if you have them um, presenting with symptom, COVID-like symptoms, um, the next step is to mask that individual immediately and place them in a designated area away from others for evaluation. Um, and if there is um, COVID-19 testing available on site, um, that's the next question. If the answer to that is no, then that individual must be tested within 48 hours. And if testing is not performed, that individual must remain out of school for 10 calendar days. Um, if COVID testing is available on site, then um, the uh, testing should be conducted of a symptomatic staff and student member immediately. Um, and then if that individual tests positive for COVID-19, if the answer is yes, um, they should be excluded for 10 days and then um, close contact contacts identified in the setting in which they were in. 
um, if that individual did not test positive for COVID-19. Then the next question is, is uh, two parts. One is either the following true, the individual is a current close contact uh, to someone with COVID-19, or is the person part of an outbreak cohort? So if the answer to that is no, then the sick student and staff should be safely transported home, again, by a parent or guardian as applicable as soon as possible, or safely transported by a parent or guardian to a healthcare facility for clinical evaluation and testing if necessary. Um, and then they can return to school um, after a negative test 24 hours fever free and no symptoms. Um, going back again up there, um, if the answer to those two questions is yes, um, and um, test to stay protocol is in place, um, or they can exclude them for 10 days. So they can either utilize that test to stay or exclude for 10 days. Next slide, please. And then the final um, situation um, that uh, school and staff members may present um, is uh, whether or not they should be excluded is if they're a close contact. So it, the first question is, is the individual fully vaccinated? If the answer to that is yes, then they are not considered a close contact. No exclusion from school is necessary if asymptomatic. Um, they should test on day three to five after the exposure. Um, and that would need to be a confirmatory test. No home tests are allowed. Um, and so they should self-monitor their symptoms for 14 days and adhere to masking guidelines. Now, if the individual is not fully vaccinated, then the next question is, was the, expo was the exposure outdoors in a non-crowded non setting? If the answer to that is yes, then they are not considered a close contact and no exclusion is required if absolutely none of the exposure's time was spent indoors or in a crowded setting outdoors. Um, now, if the question to uh, whether or not the exposure um, was outdoors in a, in a, a uh, crowded setting is no, then the next question is, were both the close contact and the COVID-19 case consistently and correctly masked during the entire exposure period? Um, if the answer to that is no, then the school should exclude the contact for 14 days unless otherwise directed by the local health department. Um, if the answer is yes, that both the close contact and the COVID-19 case were consistently and correctly masked during the entire exposure period, then the next question is, was the contact at least three to six feet distance from the COVID-19 case in the classroom during the exposure period? If the answer to that is yes, then they are not considered a close contact and no exclusion is required. If the answer to that is no, then um, the next question is whether or not the local health department is uh, recommending test to stay. If the answer to that is yes, then they will follow the test to stay guidance. If the answer to that is no, then the school should exclude that contact for 14 days unless otherwise directed by the local health department. Next slide, please. I believe this is where uh, we chime in, uh, Dan and I, so I I'll lead off. Um, middle to late September, the state came out with new guidance regarding uh, instruction for those students that are home on a quarantine. And in North Boone, what we've done to follow those guidelines, which are, uh, they're asking us to strive for two and a half hours of synchronous learning and five total hours of either instruction activities in classroom. And so we put together a plan, we've had it rolling now for a little over a week. Um, uh, for our students in five through 12, because lecture uh, and student or, or teacher instruction is so important. What we're doing with those students are, is those teachers are setting up a Google Meet. So if you're home on a quarantine, you would be able to jump on a Google Meet and hear the actual instruction that's taken place in class and follow along, listen to the instruction, hear the students uh, ask questions. Um, you may be ask, able to ask questions, maybe not, because the teacher's got, uh, you know, usually a, still pretty close to a full room there for instruction. But we also encourage the kids and the teachers to reach out back and forth to make sure that there's understanding and check-ins back and forth along the way. So that, that's for our students in grades 5 through 12. Uh, our elementary students, which are grade K through 4, if they're home on a long-term uh, uh, quarantine, 
we had, we're doing something a little different with them. It's hard to hit five different levels of reading and math instruction, which is so varied. So what we're doing is we're scheduling times where there's an hour and 15 minutes for uh, reading uh, and language arts assistance for those kids to be able to tune in on a Google Meet and work with a teacher. Really, they're kind of uh, in support of whatever instruction that they're working with that are actual assignments from their class. And there will also be another hour and 15 for them to be able to do that in math too. And if time allows, they'll be able to hit their science or social studies and any other coursework that uh, is, is popping up. So it's really more of a kind of a tutoring and instructional session there for them to be able to get assistance with the work that's being passed back and forth between their teachers uh, and, uh, and students back and forth that way. We would say also too, uh, to let you know, um, yes, they should be getting instruction every day. There should be assignments passed out every day from your uh, teachers out to your kids. So if your kids are telling you that there's not assignments or there's there's nothing there for them to do um, let's double check and if, uh, if if you're not seeing anything please reach out to your teacher or even the principals of your building so um, that is how we're trying to meet it I don't know if Dan if there was anything you wanted to add there from the Belvedere side or if you guys are doing something similar yeah sorry about that had uh, technical difficulties with my mute button as we sometimes do on these um, so user error on my, my on my end so we are in a very similar situation. Uh, we rolled out the, a very similar um, opportunity for our middle school and high school students to uh, call in and uh, hear and watch uh, the lessons that are happening at the middle and high school level. The students have a normal daily schedule. Um, our elementary version of uh, what Dr. Greenley described uh, kicks off next week. And so students that in our elementary schools are excluded for COVID-related health concerns uh, will have live instruction for half of the day and then have some time to work independently to uh, work on those class assignments that they're missing. But they'll be in a group of students uh, in the same grade level uh, for half of the day getting live uh, support and instruction, primarily in reading and math social emotional learning and then that social studies science art music and pe uh, op opportunities will be made available for them to do on their own in addition to the classroom assignment so that's very similar uh, we're just a few days uh, out yet for our elementary school students start that This is the um, updated sports guidance from Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, and it does state for indoor sports that, um, that are played indoors, um, individuals aged two years and older who can medically tolerate a mask, regardless of vaccination status, must wear a mask and maintain physical distancing to the extent possible. Um, individuals playing sports indoors must wear a mask during training, competition, and other active exercise and during um, other contacts that do not occur during gameplay, such as training, competition, um, and other active exercise, and during other contacts um, that do not involve gameplay, um, such as on the sideline or the bench or in the locker room, um, and during team meetings in the weight room, the team bus, or when carpooling or during meals. Um, and then um, that does include um, all spectators as well. Um, they should all wear a mask um, when in attendance at indoor youth sports events. Um, and that is in a P through 12 school setting. Um, as for outdoor sports, um, regardless of vaccination status, individuals may engage in training competition and other active exercise without wearing a mask for all sports played outdoors. Um, and individuals who are not fully vaccinated are encouraged to wear a mask in a crowded outdoor setting or during activities that involve sustained close contact with other people who are not fully vaccinated, particularly, particularly in areas of substantial to high transmission. Um, as far as screening testing, um, coaches, trainers, officials, and other adults um, involved in youth sports activities should test um, for COVID-19 at least once per week. Um, regardless of the community transmission level. Um, and then when the community trans transmission level is in a substantial or high level, then it sh testing should be um, conducted twice per week. 
um, individuals should be tested for COVID-19 and receive a negative result as close as possible to competition and preferably within 24 hours before play. Um, rapid antigen testing, such as the Binax now, may be most appropriate for screening testing of youth sports. Um, I do want to point out that test to state participants should avoid social gatherings and remain at home when not in school functions for the full 14-day period. Next slide, please. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, so uh, myself and uh, Dr. Eastman and Dr. Greenlee are going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that uh, we have been facing really since the summertime when we began the process of planning for uh, the back to school year 2021-2022. Um, so I'll go first and I'll just share that we've had definitely had some staffing and then onboarding and training challenges here at the health department. Um, just to be completely honest, a uh, contact tracing position is not a highly sought after position right now. Um, it really can be a thankless job most days. Um, they spend a lot of time speaking to people that are uh, disgruntled or frustrated or angered by the process or have COVID fatigue and don't, you know, believe in what's happening. Uh, politics get brought up on a pretty regular basis. It's a pretty exhausting job. Um, and those positions, uh, salaries are, are temporary. Um, so we have had quite a bit of turnover and we've had quite a few contact tracers that have left our organization um, to find other. Uh, more stable employment opportunities. Um, every time we have to onboard again, uh, we have to start the process of retraining uh, new staff and that can uh, be exhausting for existing staff and it can be hard to keep up with the workload. Uh, we do use the Illinois um, IDPH Surge Center, uh, which was stood up by the state health department to assist the 102 counties in the state of Illinois uh, with any cases um, that their regular staff that they've hired to um, do COVID-19 response can't get to at the end of the workday, which I can tell you at this point with this recent surge that we've been in have been um, lots and lots of cases across the state. Um, so that presents a challenge as well because you have uh, new surge center staff that are being onboarded um, may still be learning the guidance and sometimes the messaging that they're sharing is not always consistent with what we're working on here at the local level, or um, they may not know our community, know our transmission rates, uh, which can be very different than what's happening downstate or in the Chicagoland area. Um, so that's been a huge challenge for us. Uh, burnout. Um, I'm just gonna be really honest. Our staff are, are tired. Um, they are uh, frustrated. Uh, COVID is exhausting for all of us. We know it's exhausting for our parents and our families that attend our schools, but please understand that uh, local health department staff have been at this now for a very long time and there really isn't an, an end in sight. Um, and that is a challenge that we face too, is keeping staff morale up and keeping staff motivated to continue for really an unknown amount of time at this point and tackle the guidance changes, the um, inconsistencies in the guidance, the you know waiting on information from the state and federal government, uh, the frustration levels that are circulating in the community and, and the pushback that they get from people over the phone. Um, we have been um, struggling with uh, the test kit shortage. Uh, By next now was uh, in a national test kit shortage for uh, really about a month. I believe that the production lines are up and running again. That was the last thing I heard from the state health department. Uh, but that was a huge concern when we're trying to implement um, and move from a 10 day shortened quarantine option to a seven day modified quarantine option, and then also move towards test to stay, we have to have test kits available to be able to support that. So when there's a shortage um, that causes all kinds of logistical challenges for our frontline school staff who are doing hundreds of tests a week uh, right now, as it is just to use the 10 day modified quarantine process. Test turnaround time is a challenge as well. Um, sometimes it still takes two or three days if you go to a community testing site that's been stood up by the state health department to get those results back. Um, and so we're waiting on results to come into our system. You know, the results come back, but then they have to be uploaded into the state system. And then we have to be able to see them and then communicate that to the schools. Uh, that can cause a several day delay. And that's very frustrating for our staff because we are trying to get the information back to the parents so that we can get the information also to the schools to get the kids back in school. Um, Shield testing implementation has been um, time consuming and, and really pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Um, so we began the process 
uh, back in June and July of working with both of our school districts to um, onboard with our shield testing program. That's a University of um, Illinois saliva-based test, which we covered earlier in the presentation. Um, there has been a whole host of logistical hoops that our school districts have had to jump through, um, including parent consent forms, parent emails, uh, staff emails, and contact information. Uh, we're dealing with testing, um, testing minors, and so there's a lot of um, not only HIPAA related activities that have to occur in boxes that have to be checked, but there's a lot of logistical components. Um, I would say that we meet with SHIELD on a weekly basis with both of our districts. Um, it's taken much longer than I think any of us anticipated. We originally had a go live date of uh, the first week in September, then that got pushed back to October 1st. Uh, now it's the 12th. Um, and we'll be having a weekly meeting with them at some point in the next couple of days to get some more information on what pieces of the puzzle they're still missing from us. Um, they're onboarding about five to 10 school districts um, a week, uh, but they have a backlog of hundreds of schools that are still waiting to go live. Um, so that includes the third party contracted company that they work with that actually comes on site to our schools to provide some training, but also to actually perform the testing. Um, that has taken longer than myself or either of our superintendents anticipated it taking. Um, and it's been pretty frustrating. We need to have that PCR testing option available in addition to the Binex now, uh, to be able to move towards uh, that test to stay option, which um, we're getting close to when we look at our metrics, they're, they're downward trending, they're moving in the right direction. Now we've got to have that testing piece in place. Um, so that has been extremely, extremely hard as we've worked through that. I think the decentralized system in Illinois has been tough as well. I just want to explain a little bit what, about what I mean. So we, we receive the mandates or we receive the guidance from the state and federal government and uh, a decentralized state, you know, a lot of the uh, implementation process is uh, passed down to the local, the local health department, and the local schools in this case. Um, different decisions are made, different uh, school districts have different uh, working relationships with their local health departments. And so what we end up with is sort of a patchwork system across the state where um, some counties are doing things differently uh, than neighboring counties. They're, in, they're looking at guidance differently, perhaps they're not using the guidance to the fullest extent. Uh, perhaps they have a testing program that they've contracted out with a private company, and so they're up and running with something quicker than a neighboring county. That causes a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration for our parents and our families. Um, if you have um, friends or family that live in other counties where things are being handled differently by a different school district or a different health department, that can cause a lot of confusion. I think that in this case, it really works against us um, when things are being uh, implemented very differently from county to county. Uh, the guidance changing is also a challenge that we face. Um, sometimes the um, email isn't even drafted that I'm writing to our schools and I get an alert from the state health department that something has changed within the guidance document that I spent several days pouring over um, highlighting examples and preparing for one of our school briefings. Um, so that can be very, very challenging as well because it's hard to keep up with all those changes. And then uh, find the inconsistencies in the guidance um, across the state agencies and the federal agencies and then bring that back to the state's attention. Like, okay, we've got ISBE guidance and we've got IHSA guidance those two things don't match regarding this particular sport. Can we get some clarification? You know, we've got a football game on Friday night or we've got, you know, soccer tournaments starting or whatever the case might be. That can be extremely challenging uh, when the guidance uh, doesn't line up. Um, and then the pushback too. So um, it can be really challenging when we're not um, all working together. I can understand how frustrating um, this must be from a parent perspective. Um, I talk to parents pretty much all day long here in our office and um, hear some of their stories about what they're up against. Um, the, the negativity and uh, the anger um, and the really, to be honest, the yelling and the screaming towards my staff is, is, is pretty hard. It can be really hard for us to keep going day after day uh, when it's mostly all negative comments that we get. Um, we'll continue to work with you. We'll continue to take your calls, um, but I'm gonna put another plug in for respectful dialogue and solution-based uh, conversations because that's really the only way that we're gonna get through this. Dr. Wiesman, Dr. Greenlee, any thoughts? Yes, this is Dr. Wiesman. So I would, I think in the past, the most frustrating Thing to work with has been the changing guidance and the conflicting guidance. Um, we have not, up until this point, had a lot of staffing issues, but we are starting to see that uh, here with the vaccine slash 
screening testing mandate. So uh, because all of our employees and uh, employees of our third party providers like food, service, transportation, substitute teachers uh, have to comply with the state's uh, weekly testing uh, requirements, uh, that is uh, starting to become an issue to make sure, specifically with transportation and food service, making sure we have enough bus drivers and people to serve food it's starting to become an issue. So I foresee that being uh, the most pressing issue moving forward. Uh, Dr. Greenlee, anything else? Oh, I got I got a few things here. Um, so first off, I'd start off with to say that um, our approach up there is we have been working our tail off to make sure that um, we are minimizing every uh, thing that we can to, to stop large scale uh, quarantines. We want our kids in school. We That's what we want desperately. We're working our tail off to do that. We've got hurdles sometimes to get through. The second thing I would talk about is the shield test. I want to make sure that we we state it clearly. The shield test is not waiting on us. We have things ready to go. We're waiting for them to grab the next steps and then tell us what we need to do next. North Boone, we are ready to go for that shield test. We've been asking for it since uh, really late August and ready to go since September 2nd. So uh, one piece that I would add in there is, is that after the governor gives us his executive order and it goes to CDC and IDPH and ISBE, and then it comes down to the Boone County Health Department. The other piece that jumps into there that plays a huge um, the CDC guidance and your local health department, and that's that's what we're trying to do there too. Uh, just to kind of piggyback off what Amanda says a little bit, um, I just want to take uh, a moment to and thank my nurses and North Boone uh, School District. Uh, they're working tire tireless hours. And believe me, we understand the frustration out there about the quarantines that come to our kids and stuff. But please understand that it's not our nurses that are dying to make those calls to let you know that your kid's quarantined. They're just following through with what, what guidance says and trying to reach out and communicate that with the parents. But I'm so appreciative of, of the hard work and, and all that they've done for us at North Boone and all. Um, I, like everyone else, is we're working our best to try to get kids back in school as fast as we can. So thank you. Great, thanks. Next slide. Um, so some opportunities for improvement that we wanted to share with our, our parents and our community members that are, are listening. Um, and we talked about this, you know, it goes along with some of the challenges. So uh, we're working really hard to minimize quarantines. Uh, we're taking a look at some of the policies and procedures that are um, in place at both of our school districts, uh, working on some ways to assist, uh, you know, building administrators and, and principals with um, spacing kids out. There are sometimes are some challenges with just spacing in the buildings, which can make it really hard. Um, consistent mask wearing, and also the way in which um, the schools report to us um, who was in close proximity and for how long and who had a mask on and who didn't uh, consistently. Uh, we're working through some accuracy in reporting too. Um, the information that is provided to us by the schools helps us to determine um, who needs to be quarantined and for how long. Um, and so we're working on some consistency there, which uh, we hope will reduce the number of children that do need to be excluded and uh, the longer lengths of time that they're out. Um, we're also performing some quality assurance on the back end of our contact tracing system. When we have a complicated case where we've got um, kids that were out for a really an extended period of time, taking a look at that information to figure out, could anything have been done differently? Uh, was there any information that was possibly missing that going forward, we need to add to the surveys that the schools fill out and report to us so that we can have a more accurate picture of what's happening. Um, building safety and analysis is important as well. So uh, we've been working kind of building by building. There's been a couple of examples of situations where we've sent large groups of students home and we've taken a look at that particular classroom or that particular gymnasium or that particular layout of that building and had uh, what we would call in public health like a hot wash after the fact. So lessons learned, anything that can be done going forward in the future to avoid it being an entire classroom of students that have 
have to be quarantined or an entire gymnasium. Um, and I do think that some of the lessons learned that we've already implemented in the last even couple handful of weeks have worked in our favor. Um, we've seen just a slight decrease in the number of quarantines that have had to occur uh, per uh, exposure uh, situation. So I do, I do think that that's improving and we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, a coordinated message, I think, is important too. That's something we've uh, strived for all along, uh, but it, it's it's never perfect, and there are areas where we can make that better. One of the things that we're doing is uh, we're coordinating the scripts that our frontline staff at the health department use when clarifying uh, for parents uh, the isolation and or quarantine guidelines um, and matching that up with exactly what both of our district's frontline staff are uh, sharing with parents when they're making calls. Um, so we're actually going to be combining and merging scripts and using um, a more uniform script across all three um, entities. Uh, we do think that that will help. Uh, we're going to be reviewing that script on a, a weekly basis because, as we've mentioned uh, throughout the forum, the guidance changes so fast that there will need to be changes made to that script. That will help for new staff that come on board at both districts and at the health department to feel more competent and more trained up more quickly uh, when they're really clear on the message that they're providing and the bullet points that they have in front of them match up with exactly what the contact tracer and the school nurse and the school administrative assistant um, and the health department nurse have in front of them as well. We're going to continue to incorporate parent feedback, as I mentioned at the beginning of the forum. One of the reasons that we're hosting this set of three forums um, is due to parent feedback. Um, so we welcome uh, constructive feedback that can be really helpful as we move forward. Um, and then we're currently here in our office conducting a review of um, local data. So I have been talking with some of my colleagues who have participated in uh, pilot sites for both the test to stay program and for the shield PCR testing. And they have been up and running long enough now that they have um, good data sets to take a look at. So they can take a look at how successful those programs are and where they're still having um, issues with exposure. So we can take lessons learned from some of those pilot sites and implement those things here in our districts so that when we do have um, the shield testing go live, and as we see community transmission uh, rates and incidence rate, rates decrease Decrease as they are decreasing, um, then when we implement it, we're going to implement it right the first time so that it's sustainable, not only for this school year, uh, but this may be something that we have to have in place for multiple school years to come, depending on how uh, long it takes us to get um, more adept at living with COVID. Um, so that being said, those are some areas for improvement. Uh, Dr. Greenlee, Dr. Wiesman, anything you'd like to add? No, I think you did yeah, a good job. Sorry, Dan. No, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, I think Amanda did a really good job of covering it there. Just looking to minimize quarantines and get kids back into school is, is what I talked about earlier. Yeah, and you know, I appreciate the parent feedback on the support for quarantine students who tried to make changes there based on the feedback we got. Uh, and we are uh, continuously looking for additional staff to support. I think that's a big part of improvements is just making sure that we're getting adults into help where it's most needed. Um, unfortunately, some of the areas that we had planned on providing student support for uh, aren't going to be possible. We're, we had plans to provide increased after school support, um, but the lack of transportation availability and bus drivers can keep us from that. But we'll keep looking to see what areas we can uh, modify in order to improve that, that support. Thank you, gentlemen. Next slide. Okay. Um, so our next steps are to continue our weekly parent forums for at least another couple of weeks to work through frequently asked questions and share progress updates on what we're working on respectively at the health department and at our schools. Um, we're going to um, continue to move uh, safely towards uh, shortened modified quarantines and the test to stay program. Uh, we're beginning to pr uh, prepare to provide some training to our schools on what the test to stay rollout would look like uh, when they are logistically ready to do that and when it is safe to do so. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we are reviewing um, some pilot site data from um, both PCR shield testing pilot sites and then test to stay. Um, 
school pilot sites and as well as our own uh, data as to you know where exposures are occurring and you know number of uh, quarantine kids per exposure and working our way through uh, recommendations based on the facts that we have in front of us which is how is it going in both of our districts and what do those numbers tell us about how we can move forward and then I would just close by saying what's that long game plan right so this could go on for the rest of this school district and not to be a you know a Debbie Downer but we could be doing this for multiple school years to come. So we've got to figure out a way to sustain programs that keep kids in the classroom. And so when we do go live with a program like Test to Stay, we want to do it right the first time um, so that that program can be sustainable, making sure there are enough tests, making sure there's enough staff capacity, and making sure that the guidelines are followed in such a way that it can be do, done safely. Um, so that's what we'll continue to work on as next steps. Next slide. Okay. Um, Jen, uh, Jackie, and um, Heather Wick, thank you so much for um, assisting us with putting together today's parent forum. I'll turn it over to you to facilitate the uh, Q&A. All right, thank you. That was wonderful. Tons of great information. So um, we're going to move into the question answer period. It will be a shorter one because this is a very informational, uh, information packed uh, slideshow. Um, but questions that we don't get to, we can either follow up on them uh, after the presentation or we can cover them in the next forum. Um, so if anybody has uh, questions, they can use the Q&A uh, function in Zoom uh, down at the bottom of the screen. Um, but we have had a couple questions come in and I just wanted to share those with you guys. Um, uh, are breakthrough cases being tracked at this time? Yes. Okay. Um, do you collect and share data on the number of quarantine kids who test negative? That's a great question. Um, we track I that. Can answer oh, both. go ahead, Dr. Greenlee. No, no, sure. Go right ahead. You can speak from your perspective, please. Yeah. So the, we, we don't um, track the ones that tested and then tested negative, but we do keep a track a total of the kids that test positive each week. We do have a, a factor in there too of the number of kids that uh, have symptoms um, and that are currently waiting to be tested. So while it's not quite tested negative, you, you probably can start to get some factor close to of what's what's turning up negative. Yeah, that's, this is Dr. Wieson. We're very similar in District 100. We do uh, track the positive. The tough thing about the negative, tracking negative tests is that a lot of our families tell us that they do, you know, we recommend, um, for families that have concerns or might have symptoms that they, uh, if they would like, they could purchase an over-the-counter by next now test to do an at-home test. And we wouldn't receive those results if they were negative. So it's, it's really difficult for us to track negative results. The positive tests that go through the PCR uh, state level uh, testing uh, facility, those positive cases do get reported back to us. So we're able to do that, but not able to uh, really, there's really not a state system to track the negative uh, cases back to the schools. Okay, and then I just really had one more question that came in, um, and this one is to District 100, and I don't know as though you guys will have the um, answer right off the top of your head, um, but they were wondering how many children have been quarantined due to exposure uh, or have been quarantined due to exposure, have tested positive during their quarantine dating back to January 18th, 2021. I'm guessing you probably don't have that answer right on the top of your <laughs> exact exactly yeah, number. Yeah, I don't know that exactly off the top of my head, uh, but we could definitely uh, go back and look at that. Um, I'm assuming that some of the concern is like, hey, why are we why are we quarantining these students? Why are we excluding these students from school if the chances are that they're going to test negative? And uh, so, you know, the reason the school district is doing that and the reason the, the Boone County Health Department is following that guidance is from, the, uh, from the state is because part of our role is to uh, enforce uh, those guidelines that come from the state. So if there are concerns about the quarantine procedure per se and its effectiveness, those probably are more appropriately directed at the state level health department. So I can definitely find those out and we could share those maybe at the next uh, community okay. forum. All right, and then they, they're they also asking the total number of kids that have been quarantined during that time frame, So that can be shared then too. Um, we had two more questions come in. Uh, are students being quarantined 
if exposed to someone waiting for a test result, probable case, or only when exposed to a confirmed positive case. Yeah, that's I was um, thinking through that question here really quick. Um, Amy, I'm going to have you um, jump on and assist me with that too, as well as Julie. Um, there's a difference between those two types of potential exposures, so I want to make sure that we we state that really clearly. So, um, Amy or Julie, I will turn it over to you. Uh, yes, currently we are quarantining those students that would be considered. Um, you know, uh, close contacts to a confirmed or probable case. Um, that That's the guidance that we're using at this time. So Amy, the difference between a confirmed and a probable case, would you mind just clarifying that? Because I think that that will help to answer this question as well. Sure. And so a confirmed case is one of those that we did uh, receive test results um, from a PCR test. And that is a you know, gold standard test that those um, test results would be, um, the specimens would be collected at a um, approved testing site and then um, you know, reported properly into the state surveillance system. Um, a probable case is one in which um, an antigen test uh, sample has been collected. Um, and then that would be um, hand entered into the system and we would um, then contact trace based on that probable case. Great, thank you. And then uh, the last question that we have is, what are the guidelines and or policies for tracking and keeping children's saliva records? Oh. So this is Dr. Weitz and I can try to answer that. Um, so the, the process, we believe the process will be, in the way that the process has been explained to us is that uh, the third party provider um, or support operator for the shield testing program uh, manages that compliance as the medical entity representing the University of Illinois and shield um, and the school district um, has access to the results through an online portal. So we're not the, the holders of that medical information, but are able to access that information to then communicate uh, to parents and to our nurses, uh, which students need to be uh, excluded from school for a positive case. So uh, the University of Illinois Medical uh, Department is the controller of that medical information and that's collected by the third party provider, which comes to the school district, collects that information. They will collect that saliva from the student. Uh, they barcode it, they send it to the University of Illinois a testing facility, um, which then documents uh, the test results. That information is not stored. There's no paperwork that's stored uh, by the school district for those test results. If that helps, I think that hopefully answers the question. Yes, thank you so much. Well, um, that concludes all the questions that we have for today. We'll go back through uh, the chat and see if we had missed any and clarify any of the ones that did not get answered. Um, please join us next week. We, like we said, this is a series of um, forums. Our next one is Wednesday, October 20th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, today, we covered a lot of information on metrics, executive orders, and reasons for health and safety measures. Um, so the next two forums will focus on any updates um, and answering additional questions that you may have on school safety and how we continue to work together to make our schools safe, um, while, of course, providing the best education for our children. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and thank our presenters. Up on the screen right now is information uh, in order to contact them if you have further questions. Um, also, again, this uh, presentation and slide deck will be available after the presentation um, at Forward Boone, uh, which is forwardboon.com, and on their Facebook page. So thank you again, everybody, and have a safe and healthy day. Thank you, everyone.